This is the missing ingredient because everybody looks at that and goes, oh, there's a program that I could check eight boxes. I'm going to be healthy if I check those eight boxes. No, you will not. Hello, everybody. You're listening to Chatting with Candice. I'm your host, Candice Horback. Before we get started on this week's episode, if you want to support the podcast, you can go to chattingwithcandice.com. From there, you can sign up for our Patreon account where you get early access to episodes and shout outs, or you can click that little link that says buy me coffee. Both things help me out a ton as I'm just getting started. Another way to support the podcast is simply by leaving a five-star review and a little comment or sharing it with a friend. And this week, I want to give a shout out to my new Patreon member, X The River. Thank you so much for signing up. It means more than you can imagine. Now, let's get into this week's episode. Please help me welcome Dr. Tommy John. How have you been? I'm doing well. How are you? Good, good. I um, I'm really glad I came across your Instagram um, profile. I don't know who was sharing it, but you were like one of the few people that was taking like I think a reasonable approach to what's happening, which is like a holistic approach and focusing on like health and wellness. Right, that makes sense. Yeah, totally. So, do you want to kind of give the listeners a little bit of your background before we like delve into some of these topics? Absolutely. So. I am a student of the body. (laughs) I'm labeled as a chiropractor, but I don't like being called that because uh, there is no, in health or holistic approaches, there's no profession that that shouldn't all be saying basically the same thing, is that the body is self-healing, self-regenerating, and that the environment that we keep it in internally helps us to adapt and thrive and survive to whatever's going on outside of us. And so for 20 years, that's what I've been doing. I, I personally will never put anybody through stuff uh, until I have gone through that uh, as far as a care plan or some sort of a, an action step. Um, and what's cool is I'm still, why I say I'm a student is I'm still learning to this day that literally I'll have a new patient and I'll see something I've never seen before. And that's, that's the part that gets me like, uh, keeps me humble um, express humility and really where the patient or the person guides me, not me acting like I would know, because how, how should I possibly know in the vast infinite space that is human, (laughs) that is the human being that every time I see them on a Monday, they're a completely different person on a Tuesday or on a Wednesday. So I try to respect that and, um, and honor that. And I'm 20 years in and I'm still a student and I'm excited for what's coming. (laughs) I think that's a really good way to look at it because when you go into anything with like curiosity and the openness that you don't have all the answers, I think that you end up getting a lot further than if you're like so sold that you know everything and you kind of dismiss your patients. I think a lot of us have experienced that in the medical community where you go in and they're like, well, don't go and do your own research. Like it's very frowned upon. So I, right. um, I have like a couple, couple autoimmune issues that when I was sick, I was reading every book and yeah. Um, going online and it was like highly discouraged. I'm it, to the point where I, so I have Graves disease okay. um, and I got down, I'm five, four, I got down to 90 pounds. And for me, that is like, it looked, it was disturbing how small I was. And I kept sure. saying, I think it's this, I think it's this, I think it's this. And I had a doctor and she was from Chapel Hill. Like she had always remind me she went to Chapel Hill because that was what was important. And she thought I was just dehydrated and stressed. And I go to a walk-in, like a jinky walk-in across the street from the university. And they're like, we think you have Graves' disease and you need to go to the hospital right now. My heart rate was like over 200. Like it was, it, it was at a really bad spot. Holy shit. Yeah. And I was like, this guy who everyone in the community would be like, oh, he's just like this bootleg, you know, hand me down doctor. He's the the one that properly diagnosed me. So I think it's really refreshing to have that perspective of always learning and being the student and, you know, your patients can teach you some stuff. So with um, with the work that you do, do you have like a lot of like, is there a common question that everyone's like after as far as wellness and health? Like, do you see something like repeating a lot that people just are curious about? So here, here's the big part that I think is my day one that I need to get them to um, 
trust and buy into right away is that um, I don't fix you and I don't heal you. Uh, everyone kind of comes in like, not, not so can you help me? So can you fix me? No, I, I don't know how to fix a human being. Um, I don't know how to heal a human being other than maybe myself. Like mm-hmm. I don't, but here's what I'm going to do. And I need to earn this right on the, right on the start. I need them to list all the things they've been doing, which is pretty much what that first half hour is just listening to all the, the Chapel Hill doctors they've been to right? <laughs> and it hasn't worked. And then they have to admit that it hasn't worked. How's that working out for you? Well, they're nice. Well, they're expensive. Well, they're, <clears throat> they take my plan or something, you know, and I'm like, but, but honestly, just bottom line, is it working? Well, no. Okay. Then that's, we have to admit that because everything we're about to do quite possibly is going to be the opposite of everything you've ever heard or ever been told. And right now it's going to be hard to find this information to back it up because of the censorship and everything else. But this is why I'm with you. This is why I'm here. This is what we're going to do together. My job is to empower and facilitate, not whitewash with, with a test, throw a bunch of supplements at low numbers and you're good for three months. And then you just did it, it moved to another thing. So I just, especially now, I don't think people realize uh, the independent, the responsibility and the accountability that, that they are supposed to have for their own health. And, and that's mm-hmm. a shocking revelation and it can be upsetting, you know? And again, that's, that's, that's why I'm here to, to address your questions, concerns and emotions, because to take that on is scary for some people, you know, because they've been, they've been labeled and they've been fear-based and it's all been, instead of everything you're feeling right now and everything that test showed is your body healing itself. That's the most amazing thing I, we could ever do. They call healing sickness and it's just not the case. Did you know that it's doing this for you? It loves you. Now, what if we hear that? What if we listen to it? What if we think about our symptoms and our feelings more as guides Uh, tour guides and a conversation instead of something that needs to be muted Mm. or we're so unlucky or we need to control that and so I think that common wise like oh is it backs is it necks is it no it's it's whatever somebody's walking in with and I need to try on that first appointment get them to one believe in themselves again and that power inside and two take the accountability and responsibility that 110 percent of their health expression is on them I like that term health expression. I haven't heard that before. Right. So, yeah. So would you, how would you just define that? So it's literally like, um, our body is so unique. Our, our individualities are like fingerprints, you know? And so we can have you and I right now, we could both have, uh, what they call grapes, right? Mm-hmm. Like you and I could both go in and, and they will determine that this is our expression it's just the body trying to literally survive your environment whatever the environment it was it was doing that on purpose if they did the same plan the same algorithmic plan even in holistic same supplements same tests same and inge- same same treatment same modules same person we could have two completely different expressions of what we're doing you improved your your things improved mine got radically worse mm well, that doesn't work, or I'm not trying, or I'm just this anomaly case. No, wait a second. Our stories are different. Your and my story that led to our expression of what they call graves is completely different. Maybe my mom emotionally abused me. Your mom loved you. Maybe I was vaccinated. Maybe you weren't. Maybe, do you see Mm -hmm. what I mean? And Mm -hmm. so we get to this point and we express what looks the same, but our stories And our feelings and our intention and our purpose and our beliefs are completely different, are totally different. So therefore, we have to be approached in a different manner where we're looking at the entire story. But how we each express it is the individuality of it. And that's what's so cool is that, I mean, that's what's so cool. It's frustrating for the practitioner because we wish we could just, (laughs) you know, throw everyone in. It's like, ah, I know it's mind boggling, but that's the part that gets me excited is that every person is different. We should never repeat the same thing. Like that's the fascinating part of it. Um, And so I always love that our bodies decide how they express life. And it's, it's so unique. And each one of us is different every second of every day of every week of every month of every year. So you and I, we're touching base today. 
I know you're going to do some work. I know I'm going to do the work. In three months, if we connected, we should both be better, more highly adapted, highly expressive human beings than we were today. Like mm-hmm. hands down, that should be the way it is. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. That's really cool. So do you, um, are you a big fan of like the research happening with like epigenetics with like the book? Um, it didn't start with you. I can't remember. I'm really bad at authors. So I'm good at book titles and uh, like the body, <laughs> the body keeps the score. Yeah. So um, my, my book title that I love re- referencing is biology of belief by Bruce Lipton. Um, and I just interviewed Dr. Dawson church on my podcast and he was with Lipton when Lipton wrote that book. So they were a part of the whole, So epigenetics is, am I into it? It is the science. Like, it's not like, (laughs) like, is it a, is it a, which religion are you going with? Well, I agree with you. I totally agree with you, but you do see people that are like, oh, it's kind of nonsense. It's not real. I I was like, I'm a, I'm swallowed that Kool-Aid. Like I believe that. Mm -hmm. I know. And it's just like, wait, no, but it's pretty, it's even proven in like the allopathic model. They don't like it because it, it, it throws a wrench in their, plan but I am uh when I interviewed Dr. Dawson Church not too long ago he he blew me away not because he was giving me information you or I have not heard before but he was just like it's your belief and your intention he called it spirituality but it is your belief in healing that is that is the key and I was like after he got done talking for like 30 minutes I was like there's really no excuse you're not leaving anybody any excuse, are you? And he like laughs with this big (laughs) jovial booming laugh. And he's like, no, I mean, and then that's the scary part. And everyone's going to be like, but they died. Well, (laughs) we're all going to, (laughs) Mm -hmm. but what was life like till the spirit decided to leave? Like that's, and, and it depends what you view as death, you know, but we all, we all kind of look at it as where we all kind of pass on to this next round with a bunch of stuff, but what's our life like? Like we should be living as hard as we can. That's our purpose. That's why we chose these bodies. We chose this path. So yeah, epigenetics is, I love it. And chose to like move. So I see a lot of that, especially now in places that are a lot more strict with what you're able to do. You see a lot of people not moving. And what I think is crazy and a lot of other big names have brought it up. It's like the first thing we closed is our gyms. And it's like, (laughs) people need to move. And of course, if you don't feel good, don't be a dick and don't go and get other people, (laughs) you know, sick with your germs and all of that. But you need to be moving and like feeding your body. Like I know for me, especially as I start to get older, if I take too much time away from like my yoga or my weights, I actually like get sore. Like, you know how you get that awesome sore feeling from moving? I start yeah. getting that feeling from not moving. <laughs> and I'm right. like, we have to like, we have to put a, an emphasis on the things that we maybe are not giving enough attention to and not be so like caught up in fear of getting sick and dying. But taking like taking measures to stay healthy, right? Like, why aren't we talking about diet? Why aren't we talking about movement? Why aren't we talking about supplements? Um, I don't know where you are on the supplement train. I know like that's also some people say they're nonsense and other people say that they work. What is your school of thought? Yeah, so I, I, there is a, it's in the word. So I'm all about like these radical remissions and healing stories come down to eight, an inventory of eight different things from my just gathering experts of people doing some really awesome, amazing work and hearing these stories of, of cures and healings and and worldwide. And it's in, it's in like this quantum order. It's a belief in something greater than yourself, your purpose, your relationships, sleep, naps, breath, meditation, prayer, outdoor light exposure, or nature, nourishment, body movement. And somewhere within those eight is (laughs) is a radical healing response. I mean, if you literally take an honest inventory of those eight, honest, and you have to be honest, you have to be very, 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 very hard on yourself to see where you could improve and what work you're going to do. If all those are being tended to, and I mean worked on and Mm. uncomfortable and consistent, can a supplement supplement those eight? Yeah, hell yeah. But can a supplement replace Absolutely not. And Dr. Christian Northrup, who I've interviewed many times, she's a friend of mine. She now, um, it's like all or nothing with people, right? It's like supplements don't work. Drugs don't work. It's like, Mm -hmm. wait, 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 wait. What 
what the schools have done, even on the holistic side, and I went to schools, I have three degrees and I'm about to burn them in uh, in, a, in a, in a post because they, they mean nothing. And I want to, I got to find a safe place to burn them in California so I don't get arrested. But um, I have a post ready, but the whole thing is, is like, again, what's the easiest way to set up an algorithm, do a test, run a low number and throw supplements and oils at them. And that is, you might not kill somebody with a side effect of a supplement, whereas a pharmaceutical could seriously, like the, the risk is death. Um, but you're disconnecting that person from really getting to the real work of stuff and delaying this whole thing to a, to a later point. Um, if in the hands of the right practitioner, right, there's like many modalities and many, it's like a three pound dumbbell. Is that healthy? Uh, it depends what you do with it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Is vitamin C healthy? It depends how you, how you use it. You know, like, I, I don't know. It could sometimes certain things could not be as ideal, you know? So it's, it's, I'm just a big advocate of when we square away those eight essentials and we simplify things, you'll start to see that there's not much you need from the outside. And mm -hmm. on that small case, maybe initially, because things are so radical or you're coming off in the, in the hands of a, of a serious practitioner, a holistic one that knows what's going on, a naturopath of some kind, they may have to wean you down off of your current meds. And it might, might take some herb, like really, really strong herbs and some supplements, you know? Um, but uh, I think moving forward, supplements are great to supplement to a nice framework and fabric of, of um, those eight. And every time, I, every time, me personally, I have something off, body's talking to me and I go into those, I'm like, ah, oh. and I'll go back and it'll, it'll come back on. Give me three months. There it is. Even if it's an injury or whatever, same thing with somebody coming in. I'm like, damn, it really does come down to those. And then you interview Dawson Church or you interview Northrop or you interview Cowan or you interview Pilevsky. And it keeps coming down to those eight are pretty powerful. It's just like the sun. Like everyone's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. the sun for vitamin D and exercise for fat loss. You guys are you're like reducing these very powerful drugs <laughs> to these very one to one kind of thing like it is so potent that it's immeasurable they don't even know the light spectrum that the sun gives off because we're confined with current science like it's mm -hmm. infinite yet we don't know what it does to cells really because we can't measure it like there's so much infinite glory behind those eight and the power behind those eight it's it's free medicine really is what it is so I'm a huge, huge supplement fan in the right hands with the right intention, with the right approach. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's a great answer. What I think is um, is so awesome about like the holistic community is they've been doing a lot of these things that everyone was kind of poo-pooing on for a long time. And now that science is kind of catching up, like a lot of it's being validated. So like nature, for example, like some people think that's nonsense, but um, I'm, I am always say his name wrong. Do you know who Andrew Haberman is or Huberman? No. Okay. So he's like a neuroscientist yeah. and um, academic, and he's one of the first people to kind of explain that he, the eye is an extension of the brain. So yeah. um, he was explaining that the way that your peripherals work, if you go out into nature and you feel small, like that feeling of um, something being bigger than you and like, having a lot of space, that actually reduces your anxiety and depression by like a massive amount. And there's, there's data on this. And it, you, and people are like, yeah. Oh, all these hippies are going in the forest because they think it helps them. <laughs> right. So like that's caught up. We used to think it was nonsense when you would go and get one of those kinesiology tests and they would yeah. be like, well, what are you eating? And they're like, well, how does that have to do with my mood or my aches and pains or my sickness? Right. It's just food. And now it's pretty, it's becoming a standard practice for a doctor to look into your diet. Um, right. So I love that like there seems to be like a merging happening as we progress with science. And a lot of my listeners were asking about diet and specifically yeah. when it comes to like gluten and wheat, because um, you see a lot of trending with like the carnivore diet or Michaela yeah. Peterson's lion diet. So what, where do you stand when it comes to gluten and grains and legumes and all of those now controversial food items? Yeah. So that's an awesome question. So one, um, I just don't think right off the start, I just don't think there is a diet mm -hmm. that will work. 
because mm-hmm. we're so individual. Mm-hmm. Um, and so anything that's kind of coined diet, I'm just really, uh, I, I really have hard, a hard time supporting because, um, because we change our nervous systems change day to day we're stressed we're injured we're pregnant we're we're going through a cycle we're you know we live at different latitude we have access to different things we're hanging out with different people like how how could we possibly know what's needed when is it needed and how much and where are we sourcing it from and so to say you know no gluten no grains no legumes or or only meat or only vegetables or vegan or and it's like wow I, so here's my thing. I think it's a combination of all of them. Mm. You know, like I think every diet ever created ever that anybody like coined a name to, I think there's good parts of all of them. And so here's, here's what I love. And it upsets people because it puts it back on them. Um, there was a gentleman. So the, the nourishment principles, principles that I'm fond of are as Weston A. Price. Weston A. Price was a dentist and he traveled the world looking for oral health breakthroughs and he wanted to see what their mouths were like so he he looked at these cultures around the world and he noticed that they all had jaws that could fit all their wisdom their teeth their teeth were their jaws were wide they had these big bright smiles they never brushed their teeth they never used fluoride they never flossed they never saw a dentist so he's like (laughs) wait a second what's going on so he started to look into their nutrition Then he started to see that they didn't have diseases that the Western world did. So he's like, maybe there's something to physical degeneration and nutrition. And he started putting together not a diet of sorts, but principles. Principles like what? Like if you do consume an animal, because that's what you're drawn to, you would consume the parts that everybody discards, like the organs, the hooves, the joints, the tails, the tongues. So you go, you, it's in broth form, you know, so you mm-hmm. come up with these broths or these cultures would eat these organ meats that are so rich in vitamins and minerals, mm-hmm. like give them to kids, babies. Um, animals were pastured and grazed. They all were rotated on the same land. Like they all helped. And now we call it grass fed, but it's not even grass fed anymore. We don't even know what that is. Um, vegetables, the fermentation process of fruits and vegetables. So you had good probiotics from a natural source. Wow. If you did consume dairy, it was raw in form. It wasn't pasteurized or cooked. Um, and if you did cook with grains or you sprouted them first to make them more digestible to the community. Again, if that's what you were drawn to choosing. So some of those like make sense. I'm like, wow, that makes sense. Now here's the key. It doesn't matter whether you're pagan, vegan, <laughs> carnivore, whatever the names are. My big thing is, um, is to eat when hungry, stop when full, and make everything from scratch. Mm. And so I want to share a couple stories on that. I had a client, and she was, uh, and it'll lead to my second point, maybe the most important point. I had a client, she was beating herself up because she liked chocolate cake late at night. And she was afraid to tell me because she thought I was going to tell her or suggest to her to not do it. She's like, yeah, I eat chocolate cake late at night. I'm like, hell yeah, that's awesome. I look at it as, wow, why does your body want chocolate cake? That's amazing. (laughs) Somebody would be like, you know, gluten, this, that. I'm like, sugar, cancer. I'm like, hold on, this is fantastic. Okay, here's what I want you to do. Do not cut it out. And she like chirped up and was like, what? I'm like, yeah, do not cut it out because your body wants it for some reason. Whatever your story was leading up to this, it wants it, it craves it. I want you to make it from scratch instead of getting the store-bought version that has 50 ingredients. So now you make it from scratch and there's five ingredients. What you've done is you sourced out your ingredients, you connected to the energy that it takes to actually prepare your food with love and feelings and you're like, oh my God, I'm going to enjoy every bit of this. (laughs) There's no guilt with it, there's just straight up love. And then you sit down and let's say it's circular, right? And you cut off a piece that you would normally have consumed of the 50 ingredient cake. Halfway through, you're like, I'm full, (laughs) right? Your body got food. It sent a feedback that said, we're done. Now you just consumed less of what you would normally eat. You were in a loving environment that you made it from scratch. You connected with your food, which is far greater than any ingredient will ever come in. And that guilt is gone. Now what you might notice is over the course of a month to three months, that craving shifts Maybe it's a meat of some kind late at night. Maybe it's nothing. 
Maybe it's an acid. I don't know, but you're starting to go with, instead of looking at shunning these, these cravings and this guilt with this ingredient, because the emotions behind our food are way, way more powerful on our health expression than the ingredients themselves. And so here's another thing to keep in mind, because some people are like, um, I'll post, I post all my meals, all my stuff. And everyone's like, how can you eat that? I've been on, and it's like, okay, here's the deal. All of a sudden, gluten started to get a bad rap. They want, they, we always want to identify the one thing, right? Mm -hmm. It's a single thing causing all the disease in the world. It was sugar. It was fat. It was, uh, you know, um, sweeteners. It, it's like all this stuff. Okay, now it's uh, uh, grains and gluten. Mm -hmm. If our systems, we can only process so much stimuli at one point before the body goes in and goes, damn, I got to, we got to pick and choose like what we're going to fight here you know, because I got to go into immediate state of, of survival. If all of a sudden, while you're fighting all these lifestyle choices that you've chosen to put yourself into, and then you have gluten and the system goes haywire, we always look at the last drop in the bucket that spilled the bucket over. We don't look at the bucket, but it's like, wow, you're in a shitty relationship. You hate your job. You make more money than you maybe want to. Um, you have no direction or purpose. You don't even really believe in anything great. You haven't been outside ever. <laughs> you don't make anything. You don't. And then all of a sudden, I don't move my body. But gluten's my key. Do you know where if mm -hmm. we did all the work here, maybe all of a sudden you consume a not so strict approach to, to nourishment and you feel fantastic. I just found out the other day. Um, uh, I feel pretty good all the time. Like I make sure. And if something's slightly off, I go in and I try to figure out why I'm not. Right. But I found out I was living with mold for two years. No idea. Okay. And I did a podcast on it. And it's like, was it black mold? Was it? No, it wasn't severe. Because if it was, I think my body would have given me a warning even greater. But it just showed. I found out later because they sold our apartment and there's new owners and they did an inspection. And it was like, wow, I look at it as a victory because I lived for two years in a mold setting. And I felt fantastic. Now I'm doing all this work. They cleaned it out. I'm still doing what I'm doing. But the thing was, somebody's like, they'll look at the, here's how somebody will try to spin that. Right. But if you were, if you didn't feel so good, <laughs> you would have known that mold was in your place and you could cut it out. They try to make feeling good and health be like a negative, right? Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, wait, but we can go exist in this environment and not even be aware of stuff. And that's really how you want to live. And then you have a moderate approach, not an obsessive compulsive, but a moderate approach to trying to control the things around you. Because if we try to control everything around us, we just would never leave outside, right? We'd never go outside. And I know that was an extended answer for a, <laughs> a short question. but No, you hit a couple of really interesting topics. So I'm a huge foodie. I'm very into um kind of knowing what you eat eats like you know all of that yeah. I think is wildly important um, you know dynamic farming all of that good stuff and I think people sometimes think it's a little crazy when someone says um, you know like this was made with love or you know like they think it's you know just like a something your mom used to say but yeah. I had this conversation with someone when you're talking about AI and you know AI getting rid of all the jobs and I was like I feel like food might be one of those things where people pay extra when if they know it was made by an actual person because there's this yeah. energetic energetic exchange that happens when you cook it especially if it's what you love to do and you're cooking for someone that you care about whether it's a customer or family or or romantic relationship whatever like there is something that you're putting into that and I guess where I started to discover that was I had a the worst relationship with food growing up. I think a lot of young yeah. women do. Um, yeah. We want to be skinny. We want to make sure we're counting our calories. We're eating diet this, low fat that. And again, like the list of ingredients goes on and on. And I right. think that's kind of what led to me getting sick um, was a lot of what I was sure. eating at the time. But I would eat something and even if it was like low calories, slashed the fat, whatever I would still in my head be guilty about it and I would be like this is gonna turn in to fat and I kind of always struggled with my with my thyroid not knowing what was happening there but I think a lot of it was my relationship my mental relationship with food and then once I started improving my health and only eating um like whole foods like 
actual butter. Like I'm not doing that. You know, I can't believe it's not butter anymore. Actual <laughs> sugar, not Splenda. Right. I <laughs> lost weight, got healthier. My thyroid got um, started to level out. And I just nice. felt better. And now I can like eat something that probably is wildly high in calories, but I don't, I mean, I haven't worked out with as hard as I did back then. I just take yeah. like a casual, like mo- as long as I'm trying to move, right? Like it's not like get skinny, get skinny kind yeah. of mentality. I shifted that relationship and my body has changed and it's wild. And I tell people this cause they're like, what do you eat? You must not, you know, eat anything. You just had a baby and you snapped back and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, I eat whatever I want. If I want pancakes, I'm having pancakes and it's real maple syrup and it's not low calorie, right? right? It's the real thing. And if I want bacon, it's like, it's pasture raised pork and I'm eating as many pieces as I want to eat that morning. Like I'm not reducing or starving myself. It's, it's eating the real version of that thing. And I can't tell you enough. It makes such a difference. Um, I was reading something and they were saying, if you're trying to lose weight, a a good practice is to like take a minute before you eat and like express gratitude for your meal and think of how it's nourishing your body and then eat it. And then that's going to show you positive um, results later down the road. So with your clients, do you have, I guess, any like coaching that you do when it comes to their diet as far as getting them on the path to wellness? So what I love, I just start with strictly, nobody makes their own stuff anymore. And, and I don't even, I won't even go like ingredient sourcing really because it's overwhelming, mm-hmm. right? I'm just like, and I'll, I'll, <clears throat> I'll share with you a little 12 year old. Uh, I mean, he, he, the, da- <laughs> the dad and the mom had, had him thinking that he had extra fat and he was fat. And I'm like, oh my God, like children's <sighs> nervous systems are going like, this is a time to actually support that it's okay it's okay it's going to be okay but he had he had this complex and i was like okay what what food do you think is not a good food for you he's like in the morning blueberry muffins and so i literally had him this little 12 year old got up made his own blueberry muffins he brought them in had me try one they were fantastic he noticed he had less so if we take three months and you just start making your own dressings Mm. making your own food like just going through that process of planning it that's really the the if you can do that i know you can type into localharvest.org and locate a farm and go tour the farm near you to go form a relationship with a local farmer like if i said that right away it's like oh god i gotta go i gotta go befriend somebody and i gotta go i don't want to bring someone else in on this whole thing i'm like no i totally get it but if if i know somebody can just start to i mean think about this just starting to make their own dressings, like just dressings. I mean, we all have salad, but you bomb a Newman's own dressing. Like if you just started to make your own dressings or like you said, you know, um, make your own pancakes from scratch, make this, just just that alone, then we can get more aggressive uh, on the other stuff. But again, I'm a big, you don't have to count calories if the food's coming from a source because you'll just stop, Mm -hmm. you'll just, you just won't eat anymore. You, mm-hmm. And I've been depressed and I've been angry and I eat out of those emotions and I don't, I don't, uh, I don't shame myself. I'm like, yep, I'm depressed <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to have at this and I'm going to enjoy this moment. And sure enough, the next morning, I don't feel as well. I'm like uncomfortable. Even if it's whole, I'm like, oh my gosh, why was I feeling that feeling? Why was I getting that? You know? Um, but I love what I love now is in addition to that, giving people the resources, like there's a cookbook, Nourishing Traditions from, from Weston A. Price, and it's more like a, a textbook. I mean, it shows you how to make your own sodas, and how to make your own mayonnaise, make your own ketchup, make your own, like just how we used to do things. These traditional forms of doing stuff, because you mentioned AI. Everyone's trying to disconnect human to this newer, faster, more streamlined, connected. And I couldn't see us. I think we're more disconnected than ever because of that. And some of the stuff now is getting back to that old school way of doing stuff, because I'll say it in any, in any facet of your health life, when the body's freaking out, it loves simple. It, it loves, that's why you go to some cancer place or you go to some holistic, they always fast you right off the start. Why? The most simple form of nutrients, fast like just stop. And it's like, okay, what's the first exercise we ever learned how to do? Breathe. 
whoom, there's your training for like the next month. You are just going to breathe or you're going to move like a baby. Or what we do after that, we stared at the sun, you know, or we started to do these simple things like sleeping. A baby would sleep, breathe, nurse, de- uh, release, eliminate. Mm-hmm. Let's start, let's start there, you know? And so I love that giving people those, um, those resources, because what I'm trying to do, a friend of mine, who's a doctor, she had 20 minutes with one of her uh, patients who, who had cancer. And uh, it was one of the things that the parents were, were butting heads on who wants what treatment. And, and it was this really uncomfortable thing because the, the daughter was being pulled both ways in the middle, you know, and Oof. this little 13 year old angel um, who's not feeling well, right. And is, is scared. And so, uh, the doctor had 20 minutes with her and I, I get goosebumps now because if you had 20 minutes to talk to somebody and it might possibly the last time you're going to talk to them, you know, what well, what would you want them to know as a, God, I got goosebumps on goosebumps right now. So she goes, here's what I want you to do. The model over there that they've diagnosed you with, they use a certain language. So what I want you to do is I want you to get a Harvard textbook or whatever textbook of a medical facility that you trust. They always say Harvard. They always say Stanford. You can rent these things. I want you to look at the diagnosis in there and then the treatments. And I want you to look at the language. So this is a girl moving forward with her care because she's going to try to beat this stuff naturally because the other side didn't work and almost killed her. And she goes, um, she goes, I had to get her to understand the language they use. And she goes, we hype in the diagnosis. She was reading some of the stuff and she goes, look, it's hypothesized that this is, this is, this is, this, uh, it's presumed there's a 40% chance on a hypothesis of a, and she goes, what is hypothesis? She goes, a guess. Exactly. So they're guessing on all these diseases, but over here, the treatment is ironclad. You have to do this treatment on a guess. That's a percentage of a guess. So she just goes, listen, what she taught her in 20 minutes was how to think. And that's, that's what we've been disconnected. Nobody wants to think anymore. Mm-hmm. Like nobody, everybody wants to be told, even in our world, even in the holistic world. Hey, will you stop doing that? Will you guys organize a protest so we can end this? Will you tell me what to do? No. Why are you being such a dick? Just tell me. I'm going to (laughs) unfollow. Why do you do uh, coffee enemas? It doesn't matter why I do them. Go research them. Go try it. Go see what your body tells you. Coffee enema? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. They're fantastic. That sounds so intense. (laughs) (laughs) So it's not like scared. No, but uh, I was turned on to him. Kelly Brogan's into him. My buddy who's Serbian, he's been on him for a while. And every Saturday, Sunday, I'll do three, three Saturday, three Sunday. But they're a Gearson therapy clinic. A bunch of cancer institutes will do them. There's just a, there's something to them. And I, I, again, I've been drawn to certain things. And if something comes across my dashboard and I can't ignore it anymore, I, I go and I go, I go tackle it. And there's a couple things. Well, I've been doing coffee enemas for quite a while. But again, I posted it on Instagram, just like a picture of me holding the bucket, not like me. Uh-huh. And uh, and they're like, why do you do them? And I'm like, go research and find out. Why do you have to be such a dick? I'm, like, I'm sorry, but that's where we're at now, right? Is is I, The reason I told that story, there are a couple of reasons, but she had 20 minutes and she wanted a 13-year-old to think about her care to think Mm. about what her body's doing, to think about the brilliance of it, because nobody else wants you to think that or critically think about anything. That's why they hide the information or they do stuff that's automated or they shut us down or they go, we got to skip back to that critical thought again. And I I thought that was brilliant, almost to tears because, you know, this little girl's struggling and scared. and, And when she was done with it, she was like, she had this like power back. Like I, I can do this. Yes, you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's so important because when you're when you're really sick, it's it's a really vulnerable time. And the last thing you want is someone just like dismissing you and not including you in your own treatment plan. Like for me, that was the worst part of when I was sick. And I mean, obviously nowhere near as as difficult as cancer, but um, still very traumatic. And the most powerful thing was when I decided to, you know, take 
my autonomy back and say, I'm going to participate in my healthcare decisions because it's my body. So I think it's, it's really wonderful to try to get people to actually do the research. And obviously, no, you don't have a degree, but that I can tell you right now, I probably know more about like PCOS and Graves disease than most doctors do. And that's just a fact. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? Like I've lived with it for so long that I've consumed so much material from all sides because I don't have a dog in the fight, right? Like I don't care if you're holistic or if you're traditional medicine, I'm going to read both. And then I'm going to kind of see where I feel the science makes the most sense or like the outcomes make the most sense where both parties are so can be so convicted in their team that they're not willing to hear the other side. So I think you have right. a huge advantage from being the patient, right? Cause you're, yes. you're just so open to anything really. That's what I love. And that's how I think is way more powerful. That's why I'm burning my degrees is that <laughs> I, I, the degrees limited me. The degrees made me worse. And I'll full, I'll full say that it's $500,000 in education. I could have gotten, I mean, it's a goodwill hunting quote. It's a, uh, it's the dollar forty-five in late charges of the public library. Like we, we could just go get the information, dive down, and go access it in this unbiased way, you know. And then you go, and then you go see what sits with you, what what resonates. Keep what makes sense. Discard the rest, and never stop digging. Keep mm-hmm. going, keep going, and that's what makes you. The doctor should be listening to you, not the other way around. But we've got it to where it's I'm degreed. Science says. And now it's even over 90%. There might not be any science left out there that's not bought or purchased, according to Dr. Tenpenny and some others who are like, it's so that that the whole like science, ah, science is like challenging, right? Like science is never settled. It's a, mm-hmm. I don't know, but that's, that's a scary thing. But I, I would put what you said right there. We don't have to be scientists, virologists, immunologists, doctors to take, uh, uh, an active approach in our um, health journey, our bodily sovereignty, our autonomy, like you said, uh, it's our accountability, our responsibility right now. And they, they joke, the doctors will put, put the post. Yeah. My degrees and your mom Googled the term or whatever. And then over here, like, yeah, I could Google because I'm not bound by some, you know, Mm -hmm. school. It's like, everybody's using that thing. And I, what, what seems to work with you? I'm not saying either go, whatever sits with you. I know what I'll do. You know what you'll do. And Mm -hmm. and that's all we can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think another really important part to healing is, is the mindset, right? Like that's kind of be going to be like the determining factor. And do you know, I'm sure you do, but do you keep up with Joe Dispenza? Yeah, hell yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so I think for anyone that doesn't know, like he's doing really powerful stuff when it comes to healing. Um, I credit that man and like a lot of those practices as well. I think a lot of it is, believing that you're going to get better and it's going to sound crazy but like your level of like true happiness like if you're just a a, if your neutral is happy and grateful and at peace versus are you constantly in in fight or flight right which a lot of us were I definitely was like I was always like ready I don't know what I was ready for but I was ready you know I was just like constantly waiting for the sky to fall kind of a thing and I did so much work with that and forgiving all sorts of things forgiving myself forgiving other people and when I started to do these meditative practices and realize like there's something more to this healing process is when I started to see results so I guess my question is um do you think a lot of times when people seek out holistic specialists like they're already at that point of discomfort where they're they're willing to uh, like to kind of take a magnifying glass to like their own cause like their own um what's the word uh blame is like a gross word so I don't want to say blame but like taking accountability like it is accountability yeah yeah Mm -hmm. I we I've we've asked we asked Sarah G of Green Med Info when he was on our podcast. I asked Dr. Northrop, I asked Dr. Brogan, I asked, do we have to bottom out to really take the action? Like, do we you and I have had our journeys and like uh who was I on? I did a live, we did three lives on Saturday. We launched our nonprofit. We did so it was one of those things. We've seen the future of where this heads do you know what i mean so we can say no you got to do i mean we can say with emotion this is what you have to do but people have to get to that point 
to want to change. And that's what stinks for us because we have loved ones and we want to save people. Mm -hmm. And I love humanity (laughs) and I want to, I want to save some people, but I can't save them. So I have to acknowledge like, Hey, even in my family, like, I love you all, but it's your life. And Mm -hmm. I'm here if you want, but it's not. So when somebody finally comes in through the door, typically they've gone through the, the meat plant and they've seen, they've seen behind and they're just like, I just, I don't, I didn't ever trusted what was going on. I, it didn't work. Um, I'm worse now. I, and then they're open and ready and willing. And so a lot of the times when you do say, when you do say, um, this is going to take some work on your part. This is going to, and you, again, you, you don't call them out, but they have to admit the the choices I've made up until this have led my body expressing this way. And that's why it wants to heal. And it's not your body hating you. Your body's doing it because it loves you and wants you to keep going. And as soon as you like mold that reality, like, wait, this is, this is maybe the most important relationship we all have. Not our kid, not our husband, not our wife, not our, no, you you first is like the most loving relationship with you. And then you realize, well, wait, it's got my back at all times. Um, another doctor friend of mine, Cassie Huckabee, she said, uh, she goes, you know what? And when she phrased this, I use this at all my talks and stuff because it makes me want to almost cry. She goes, uh, we, we poison ourselves. We, uh, we defile it. We talk bad to it. We have bad thoughts about it. We, we give it poor food we torture it we punish it it keeps coming back and it still loves you <laughs> it's like yeah. we're we're so cruel to it but it loves us back no matter what and when i heard that i was like oh my god i mean we've all had relationships right we've all had it's like it's like the dog like the dog keeps coming back and wants to party no matter how many times you punish it or, and it's like dude everything that's going on in your body everything nothing is random everything has a that blue spot on your right knee the wart you had as a planner's wart at 10 years old there was a reason for all of that and the body doesn't know how to speak it just knows in the language of expression symptoms whatever they would call it's just the body right? Um, A cold sweat, pit of your stomach, vomiting, a a fever, (laughs) an itching sensation, acne. I mean, is it really any different than cancer? Cancer is just the way the body is is maneuvering things to put them into a detoxing process to help you survive. Shit, that's, that's huge. Then we can talk about it in this huge spectrum of just, this is the body, this is the relationship, this is that mindset we have with the most loving exchange and union and this coming from a single guy like I, i'm i'm talking to dr northrop i'm like i'm kind of okay like being single like i really truly love myself so and it'd be cool to share this eventually but i'm not like feeling like i'm missing out because i've done so much personal work that's like my god first and foremost i gotta take care of me first and foremost here's what we got um and you said uh dr joe dispenza uh we went to the same chiropractic school oh and, really uh, yeah. And he started off as a Cairo and then obviously learned, you know, there's, there's more he wants to get into. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of one of the, where I got those eight essentials, his, he has four points, uh, four things people have in common to radical healings. And I kind of took in his list and I was like, wow, that's interesting to all his thousands of stories. Right. And, mm-hmm. and you've read and seen, uh, becoming supernatural and you are the placebo and like just fantastic books. Right. Um, but that first one, believing in something greater than yourself and two, that your body is self-healing and self-regenerating like those two top points. If you can't get those two, everything after will be good. Like, like, but we want, do you want to heal or do you not? And all those stories of that woman healed cancer and you hear it and she, she just goes, you'll hear the story. And there's a little key note into all these stories. And if you listen to that language, It goes, they were fed up and they wanted to fix this or they wanted to do this. It was just that desire of want. Mm -hmm. And when we have that intention, and that's why Dr. Dawson Church, again, he goes, the intention in your spirituality, your feelings behind that and knowing, and you're going to take this on. I've got it. Now check your relationships because I know you got them and I know I have them and still if the relationships in your life are antagonizing that belief and that 
ooh, we got to we got to set up boundaries or we got to cut some some old, you know what I mean? Because if they're getting in the way, Mm -hmm. pushing this doubt into you and constantly surrounding you, you have to be surrounded by this whole thing. That's that's which you'll probably attract it to behind. I've got this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this right now. And every story of healing is preceded with. I knew I could. Mm -hmm. think about that the four minute mile the four minute mile it was like unbreakable Mm -hmm. because medicine said it's unbreakable you can't break the four minute mile medicine medicine your heart will explode Mm -hmm. your heart will explode (laughs) you're gonna pull the muscles off your body it's like not possible so nobody did it worldwide the doubt was set the the ceiling was set and then one dude did it and then within a month like 18 other people across the world did it it was like "Ah." and that's where if one person's healed from whatever they've labeled with a name then you have that capacity inside you. You have that option. It's here. Mm-hmm. Let's do it. So why do you think we have to reach like an unbearable amount of suffering before we get our shit together? And I'm no different. Like that was very much right. my story too. I was, just, <laughs> I was, I was as stubborn as they come. Mm-hmm. Um, so why, why is that our nature? So being, I think being in a, in a very, so I'm not a, uh, I'll read two books and will experience what 19 others have written. Do you, do you know what I mean? Like I'll go on experience and then my buddy who just reads all the time, he's like, oh yeah, you know that thing you're doing on feel. Yeah, it's so-and-so did it back in 1952 and he wrote about it or they wrote about it, blah, blah, blah. So I think we're in defense. We're always in like survival that we don't want to, if, if we thought about all the dangers, like if we were constantly on guard, Cause we've, we've been like evolved through, we have to protect this now and go. And it, it always defaults to storing fat. Why? Because there was famine. Couldn't it be the opposite? Couldn't it just be easier that we, it's just like easier to lose. <laughs> but that's like not our, it's not how we've, we've, we've gone through the, the span of time, you know, like it's always been from really what threats do we have right now? I mean, we kind of cruise in a car, we have food on every, now you and I know differently, but the, the general, there's not much we really need to worry about in, in the, in the mm-hmm. lions in our caves type scenario, you know? Mm-hmm. So I think it's got to, we have to experience the feeling and the thoughts of what it would be like to either have it. That's why I've said, and I, I I've said it during this whole thing and I don't, I don't want it to be taken wrong. And so many people have, I don't think we've changed enough with what's going on right now. Like for us to be better. Like, I don't think we've gotten scared enough and I don't like that people are suffering and and going through a lot of stuff, man, because I know a lot of people who are having issues and my God, but I'll say we need a stimulus greater than the stimulus that caused the injury in the first place or the imbalance. Now, what is a stimulus? A stimulus could be you and I having, or you and your husband having a difficult discussion about something and and emotionally you measured it on like an eight out of 10. Like, damn, he measured a nine. Like you guys had some really, really tough moments. Okay. So the body's going to try to compensate and survive that environment until something opposing that comes in to offset that and get the body to go. That wasn't necessarily a bad thing. That was just a moment that we experienced in this string of life. Mm -hmm. Oh, because otherwise it'll say, if it starts coming up towards that, no, not that again, not that again. Oh my God. Oh my God. And it could be in the version of anything. It could be anything at all, you know, like would trigger that because your husband was wearing blue that day. Or you were wearing, and then all of a sudden now the music was playing. And now every time you have that music, oh, shit, oh, my God. And then it's like, wait, (laughs) we got to come back and go above that. We can use it in injury. We can use it in death, divorce. I mean, I had a family member die, and that was one of the worst moments of my life. But it was like the greatest moment of my life because my perception and and awareness of, of what was valuable to me. Now, I've bottomed out since then, but I made that moment in my life make this like I couldn't be more grateful that I got to experience my brother for 28 years and his death. Although I'd love to have him here. He's somewhere greater. I don't know where where he's at, but like for me, that was one of the greatest moments of my life. And it's like your brother dying. Yes. Because of that 
that event, what the work I did still doing today, 10 years later, like, wow, are we ever done? I wish that's why I, I wish we could get people to understand what it would feel like. And all we could do is share, share, share. But in the end, it's their journey. It's their personal. My dad's going through some, some uh, health stuff now. And I, I look at death so differently now. I'm looking at him and I'm just like, I'm not, it's not a scary thing. It's not something we're trying to avoid. I'm like, this is his path. This mm -hmm. is his life. His spirits might be ready to leave. Have we asked him what he wants to do? It's like, we have to get him to the doctor. We have to get him to this. We have to get this test, this test. Does he want it? Like, I, I don't know if he wants those things or if he wants to hang around. I would hope, uh, I'll share a story real quick. The guys next door, um, he had a American bulldog and those dogs aren't, they're like inbred to hell. Their noses are all smashed. They got wrinkles, like infections on their face. He's uh -huh. got so many issues and they don't live long. Well, he was starting to not, uh, on Christmas Eve, he was going down by the, where the other animals are buried that they've had for like 30 years, their pets in the yard. And he never goes down there. And so they kept bringing him up and putting him in the inside, bringing him up, putting him inside. And then all of a sudden he was having this internal organs shift and some really scary stuff. And then he passed away right after that. Well, I look at death differently, especially after 2020. And I'm looking at that story and I'm like, his body knew. Mm -hmm. He knew he was coming to an end. Where was he going? Where he felt comfortable, which was amongst these other, I, I don't, I mean, I'm just trying to make sense of this, right? Mm -hmm. So if we looked at that and I was, his name Snack Pack, <laughs> and I was Snack Pack the bulldog, and I was going down to this part of the yard, I would want my loved ones to come join me down here. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So if, mm -hmm. again, if you look at it, like, what if we curled up in the bushes with him? And we were where he wanted to be as he transitioned to this thing that his life wanted. You start to look at that instead of the other where we do it in life where we put somebody in a hospital for a month, you know, and that, that's fine. That's a choice, whatever. It was great. We have access to a lot of this stuff. But what if they just wanted to go to the bushes with with their, you know, their their and feel comfortable and have this transition be something that's very peaceful with some loving people around them? I don't I don't I don't know. Um, it's very empathic of you, though. I think we as a society have a lot. We've lost a lot of that. Yeah. And it sucks because that's like what creates those really amazing, magical relationships, whether it's with another person or even with other animals. Um, you don't you can't get into that headspace and you can't think of like, well, what do they want? What are they trying to tell me? How are, what's going to make them the happiest? And right. I think a lot of that is because we're getting away from that thought that something is bigger and more powerful than yeah. us. And it's not to say it has to be organized religion or it has to be spirituality or it has to be Buddhism. Like there are so many paths to that concept, but it's almost like, it's almost looked at like you're living in the Victorian era. If you talk about God or the universe, or if you talk about destiny, like any of these things, people kind of get really uh, turned off about. Right. And it's, it's curious, like, how did we get there? Because to me, that's so egotistical to think that we are like as big as it gets. And yeah. it's like cynical to think that this is it. Right. And maybe that's like the romantic in me, but I consider myself to be a, a pretty spiritual person. And yeah. it's hard for me to grasp, I guess, the um, just like the knowing that you're right and that there's nothing else. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I uh, so I. I feel closest. I was raised in church and church just never felt comfortable to me. The whole, <laughs> the whole of it. And I'm not saying whatever somebody wants to believe, but when I was sitting there, okay, this is supposed to be this connection with this person called God. And there's, okay. Okay. I get it. I, I get what's and there's good and there's bad. All right. I feel closer to whatever my version of God is when I'm standing by the ocean or when I'm watching pelicans surf a wave, or I'm looking at the moon or the stars, or, and I'm looking at, or I'm in a forest, you know, you mentioned forest earlier, like I feel closer to, or more than I ever have sitting in a, in a church. And it's one of those things that it's in various forms. It could be in the looking in the eyes of your newborn. Mm -hmm. Like that could be something that's like, oh my God, I just grew that. <laughs> and it's like this infinite potential inside and they're more connected to spirit than we will ever be ever as adults. Like, 
what could I learn from that little thing right there? And then you put something like um, that we've only explored and know 4% of the ocean. <laughs> like, and I'm stepping in this thing that we, we don't know anything. That was another conversation I had with, with that Cassie, Dr. Cassie Huckabee. What do we know? Like without, with all certainty, what do we know? And there's not much, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? And when you go there, it is for some because they want to control. They want to control and control and control. It's like, I find that very empowering. The fact that I don't know and that it is this exploration that every day is something like, wow, what could I see today since we don't know? And the infinite potential that is around us at all times is connected into us and ourselves on a level through light that is like, we, we don't have it. There is no limit. That, that right there just has me fighting and has me getting up in the morning and has me grateful, like some days harder than others. But that, that small little thing, one keeps me tiny. (laughs) And then in that tiny is this, you know, expansive, uh, uh, possibility. So. Mm -hmm. It's, there's this quote and it says, it's not what you don't know that gets you in trouble. It's what you know, (laughs) to be certain. (laughs) And if you think about it, it's like, yeah, that's pretty accurate. That's gotten me in most of the trouble in my life. And then once I started to accept that I don't have all of the answers and I have no idea what I'm doing, I'm just trying to live every day with tiny bits of improvement, right? That's it. Doing what I can do. It's been a lot easier. (laughs) And you're lucky you have a newborn. So now you can get instructions from like this higher being. This is crazy. It's very cool that you say that because... We we just started this conscious parenting course, and oh, yeah. um, I feel like a lot of it, we're like, well, of course, but then we relate it to like our parents who are obviously a couple generations older, and I was like, ooh, they were not conscious or aware. <laughs> they were very reactive parents, because right. my husband and I, like, even before we started this, we've always had that that attitude that we're probably going to learn more from him than he learns from us. Like, oh, wow. I don't know why that was just kind of instinctive for us. Yeah. But that was very much not the case with either either of our upbringing, right? Like my parents were like, you don't know anything. Listen to your elders. Exactly. And I'm like, there is such an opportunity here. I always like say to like re-experience magic because they see the world so different than we do, right? Like they don't have all these filters on. So it's like, well, what's he paying attention to here? What's he trying to tell me with this? And then really just trying to rediscover what it is to be present. Right. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. Yeah. It's really, really incredible. So for me, it's like, it's the best. And I think going to be the most challenging thing I've done. (laughs) I'm hoping this conscious parenting will give me a leg up on it because I'm trying not to like mess him up too bad. (laughs) That's the thing, right? Like the fact that you're even acknowledging what you just said right there is, is better than what we were exposed to or or what, you know, just that right there. Mm -hmm. I, I, he's very, very fortunate that he's growing up in a house that has two parents yeah. talking like that. Like that, that makes me feel good about youth. <laughs> you know, like there is ha- houses where these youth are being exposed to that. Damn. I'm so grateful for what I was exposed to, how I was raised, because I am who I am now. Mm-hmm. But it's like, okay, wow. All right. Let's try to, let's try to f- promulgate that, like get that going, that thought process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hopefully there's a little bit more of that and a little bit less of the traditional parenting approach, but we'll find out. Yeah, like one of her opening lines was, um, oh, no, this was another thing. I'm I'm doing like a bunch of these master classes. I obviously I'm obsessed with like learning and self-improvement. But um, it's funny, like, do you find like some things just like come across to you and you're like, I wasn't looking for that, but that popped up and I'm intrigued. So I have to go do it. I guess maybe like your coffee animals. (laughs) It's just something that was calling you. Anything. Yes. So I was signing up f- um, or re-logging into my master class on my TV yeah. and it had you go on your computer to connect the whole thing. And I was like, well, this is freaking annoying. I just want to watch this one class. So I log on and it has a trailer for RuPaul come on. And I was like, I don't follow him. That's really like outside of my like normal interests and all of that. Yeah. But I, I'm trying to log in and it's playing, playing, playing. And the whole message was on um, creativity and finding your authentic self. And I was like, well, that actually does sound really interesting. So maybe I'll just like see what a couple of the shorter intros are about this. And without judgment, right? Because I'm like, oh, it's probably going to be like all like superficial and drag. And that doesn't apply to me. 
right? right? I just, right. I just go into it. And it starts getting into like frequencies and generational traumas and how most parents that most of our parents had um, never had a loving relationship with themselves. So how are they going to love someone else? And all of this like really deep, cool content. And I was like, I feel like this is something I need to explore. So um, yeah, I feel like when stuff like ha- that happens, it's like little serendipitous like hints, right? And you just have to follow them and see where they lead. So that's what, uh, so to give you, so I, I fully like on those, I'll see those more and more. And Dr. Dawson Church from studying this, like studying these things, he goes, when those moments happen, because I shared one of the biggest moments and, and then others will like, like more, he's like, that's how you know you're, you're ascended and you're now vibrating at a higher frequency. You are high. Be, because you're, you're now being aware of them. Those are always open to us. Like they're always mm-hmm. there, but are, when are we ready? Some people are so closed off that they just never see them. They just cruise by. Um, somebody else called them cosmic winks. Ah, um, these, I like that. And I, lo- I love that. Right. Like uh-huh. cosmic winks. And I was like, so if, if you all of a sudden notice there's more, you're, you're on it. Keep going. Like, like whatever you're doing, you're, you're here versus here, like, like 4D to on your way up. And I'd never, he studied uh, consciousness is more infectious than contagion. Our thoughts can affect my thought to you or your husband's thoughts could really create an internal environment based on what's going on there, then passing something from the outside into you that would, he was talking about uh, like a flu. Mm -hmm. And he goes, consciousness is like, 40% 40% more infectious than any germ. And I was like, oh my God, like that makes so much sense to me, but he's like proving it with his science, right? right. Of, of what they're able to measure now. So mm-hmm. when you notice those, so you're, when this happens, you're That's dialed so in. That's so interesting. So I have to share this story. I told my husband, yeah. like I, I went to the store the other day and I was driving into Whole Foods and there were these two um, like homeless men on the corner. There's usually like one or two there and someone had just given them like a bunch of Panera. So they were just hanging out and eating. And I was just like watching. And all of a sudden I got the number 25. The number 25 just came to me like in in dollars uh, specifically. So I was like, okay, maybe I'm supposed to buy like a gift card and just, you know, hand these guys like a gift card. Like that's what I made made of that. So I do my shopping and I'm checking out and there's this woman in front of me and I can't really see anything because it's the whole distancing and whatnot. She had a jacket and um, it turns out she was paying with like an EBT card. Okay. And like all of a sudden I'm putting my stuff up and I hear the cashier go, okay, you owe $25. So my, like I perk up, but I'm trying not to be nosy and she didn't hear. So he repeated it and she goes, Oh, I'm sorry. I don't have any, I don't have that. She's like, why is my, her card for some reason wasn't covering the food that she needed to buy. So I kind of peek over and she's got like a one or two year old in the car and she's like very upset. And the cashier is like, let me get the manager and see if he can maybe comp you. I don't know, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I'll take it. And everyone just stopped and looked at me and didn't say anything. And I was like, yeah, I'm like more than happy. Like I'll cover it. And she was so like taken aback. She couldn't, she didn't, couldn't say anything. She literally couldn't get any words. And I just scooted in and like paid or whatever. And she's like, I lost my wallet and I don't have anything and blah. I was like, it's fine. Like I've been there. I've, you know, it's a terrible place to be. I hope you have a good day. And the cashiers were just like, still just jaws on the ground. And I was like, it's 25 bucks. And like, I I had to do it. And it was yeah. just the weirdest thing. Like I almost started crying afterwards. It's like know, the cashiers right? were all emotional. <laughs> and I like tell my husband, like, you won't believe it just happened. Like the weirdest thing. Cause yeah. it was, I was like, I couldn't ignore it. And I was, I was yeah. like, I don't know what the significance of that is. Cause to me, it was just 25 bucks, but sure. where it gets weird is that that number popped in my head before. It was just so interesting. I was like, I wish I could know where that led. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I know. And maybe, maybe you knowing then changes that it wouldn't have if you knew mm-hmm. like what you're, do you mm-hmm. know what I mean? It just yeah. came, you went on tr- trust and faith and I don't know. Um, wow. Isn't that, that creepy? Yeah. It's that wild. And people saying like, this sounds weird. I think we could throw that out. I don't think that phrase works anymore. <laughs> I'm for it. Yeah. <laughs> like this is, <laughs> that is so how I would, <laughs> if we were, if we were ascended stuff like that would be like, Oh, oh yeah. 
where are we going to eat? We would just like call upon this stuff. Do you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like <laughs> that's maybe how we're supposed to be. This is so those stories I love. I love, I love, I love. Yeah. So wow. when we, when we start talking about like that interconnectedness and like that mag, yeah. like that um, energetic field, which there is actual science, like, I don't know how they do it. Cause it's way <laughs> above my IQ yeah. level, um, but it's out there. I've been doing a lot with it. Cause I recently got a horse and oh, nice. um, a lot of it is so like their energetic field is like 10 times that of a person yeah. and doing like, there's a lot of like equine therapy that you can do and like getting into their energetic field because they're very empathetic creatures. So like if you're anxious, the horse will start getting anxious. If you're in a bad mood, the horse is going to be in a bad mood. Um, So it teaches you a lot about being aware in your of your feelings and like not hiding from them because you can't when you're on the horse, right? Like that you could get injured if you do. So when it comes to that, if you can energetically connect to another animal, right? We know that we can energetically connect to other people. So how do you think that works um, when we start talking about healing and we start healing ourselves and the ripple effect and the energetic effect on other people? That's another thing. That's the reason I, one of the reasons I moved to California. Um, I was in Chicago for 14 years, northern, northern suburbs of Chicago. And I was living like a B minus life. I could be happy. Like, like Mandela was happy in prison because he shaped his mind. Victor Frankl, like Mm -hmm. made some sort of paradise in a concentration camp. Like, again, I could, was I in a concentration camp? I mean, it was Northern Illinois. So I don't know. It was like (laughs) just the weather and everything else. I'm like, I'm just not happy. Like this sucks, man. I deserve more than this. Like, this is not why I was born, but I was bringing that in to my practice and I was touching people. If I'm touching them, well, now I'm exchanging shit. They don't, I mean, they know it, but they don't know it. You know what I mean? And I'm like, I am not going to practice this way. Like, I I am not going to do it for them. I'm not going to do it for me. And that's when I started the journey of trying to find where I want to be so that I'm just like, like literally high on life almost every single day I come in because of the exchange that I have with that person as a practitioner, right? Mm -hmm. Um. And then I do these posts on my Instagram often. It's TJ and Omi time. Omi is a neighborhood cat, O-M-I-E. And he's this little tuxedo cat. And at first, he's very picky and choosy because he knows, he feels, he sees, right? Stuff we can't even, your your son can see (laughs) and the horse can see, but you and I uh, can't right now, but we're trying, right? Mm -hmm. And so it came to what's the most vulnerable part of a cat, their belly. And so I was, I'm a, I've owned cats, I've owned animals, like ever since I was a kid, I feel like I connect with them very well. And uh, a while back, I was, I was petting him, I was doing something and I went for his belly and he like, you know, he nipped me and I was like, all right, okay. And then he wouldn't hang out, he wouldn't. And then all of a sudden, one day there was a shift and now he lets me like lay up behind him and I'll put, he like hooks his back leg over my arm. Like he pulls it in and I can scratch his belly and he'll like drool into a purring <laughs> mess. Like he just like, so that's our thing. And I, I made the post yesterday and was just like, connect with animals as often as you can. One to just to learn. If you literally look and see the responses to you, and see that exchange to you can learn more about yourself and exactly what you're saying with the equine therapy, right? Like, mm-hmm. uh, or, or getting in the ocean or doing something where there's animal based, like they're so pure, but my octopus teacher, I don't know if you saw that. So movie. good. Uh, oh, oh God, right? so good. <laughs> right. <laughs> like stuff like that. I just think we can learn from so much more around us then who we're putting up on these pedestals. We should put animals and children and women up on these pedestals. Like, Hey, you guys are connected. (laughs) Like teach us. Can we learn (laughs) like what's going on? What can you show us? Um, Because understanding too, I I think the, 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 the seriousness of what I'm trying to say, I moved because I was a practitioner who wasn't healed, healthy. I'm never healed. I mean, we're all doing the work, but I was affecting people because I was exchanging them with a touch, exchanging them being their presence. Mm -hmm. And you got, we have to think of the profound impact that we have by Kelly Brogan says it, Dr. Kelly Brogan, she goes, um, you owe it to humanity to heal yourself, to do the work. And when she said that, I'm like, 
That's exactly how it is because you and I right now are putting up into the ether this, this energetic expression, this energetic signature. A healed one is beneficial to people across the globe. So we owe it being here to do the daily work, to try to evolve and adapt at a higher level and serve humanity. Like that's, so it's not just like, oh, I want to heal because I want to be able to enjoy my kids and do this, this, this. You, you owe it to everything. Like your, your exchange of you being brought onto the earth is to, we would say, you know, serve higher level, this, that, heal, like mm. heal. That's it. So think of that, think of that like contract. Think of that, you know, binding agreement you have with now it all of a sudden does bring you, but it shows how you're connected with everything around you. And I think that's profound, uh, chokes me up, um, holds me accountable as well, you know, for my, my service. And, and it's like, we can get very wrapped up in our own, our own stuff, you know, but mm-hmm. I think that's the bigger picture is uh, we owe it to humanity. Or if we want to change and shift things, heal yourself, mm-hmm. go in and try to better yourself. Uh, Oli Olerton, one more story. Oli Olerton, I interviewed him. He's a former SAS, like uh, special forces dude. So I wanted just a different perspective. Honestly, the way he talks is the way you and I talk, the way Kelly Brogan talks. He's just like, yeah, what are you talking about? Accountability and responsibility for yourself. He's like, we had something when we were in the shit and there's a whole battalion of us. We have a one meter squared rule. Like, what's that? You worry about one meter square around you. Everything within that one meter, you take care of to the greatest of your ability. If we all do it, we all just became this cohesive unit that could take down whatever they're going to do. And they're, mm-hmm. they're, they're tougher to disperse and destroy. And I thought that was fantastic because we always look to the, hey, over there, what are you doing for me? Hey, can you protect my, you know, there is that element, but we got to go first. And that's a special forces badass saying mm-hmm. the same thing, you know, I thought mm-hmm. it was cool. That is really cool. Yeah, that's, um, I'm reading this Zen book right now. And he was saying like the Zen Buddhists say like you have to tend to your own garden before you do anything yeah. else, before you source anything else. And a lot of times we think that's selfish, right? We're like, right. You, how dare you create boundaries for yourself? Like I need your help. But a lot of that comes from not having your own boundaries, right? right. And then you expect others not to do it. So I think it's really important to understand it's like the fill your cup first. So you have your cup and then you have maybe like your husband has a cup below you and your, your child has one below there. And then your in-laws are beneath that where whatever order you'd like, but the idea isn't to take from your cup and, and just disperse it evenly. And then you're left empty. It's to overfill your cup to where there's such an abundance. It's like spilling out and then everyone's benefiting from that. So it's a lot less of a scarcity mindset and just having like that abundant mindset and like as long as I'm doing the best for myself it's going to make my child the happiest and my marriage the happiest and it's just a different perspective right it's a more positive and like empowering perspective than like a have to right right so I love that you you have a partner like I love that too it filters out those that are willing to accept that because some people would look at that as selfish or what's in it for me or and it it makes that what's our company that we want to surround ourselves with. If somebody's looking for a, a mate, uh, 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 somebody mm-hmm. like there's a lot of these defining factors like, like that. And then you now are raising a child in that environment with that mindset. That's mm-hmm. amazing. And you have to have it as a parent because and it's, it's something I'm still learning because that mom guilt is there, right? Like when I, like right. I have to drive half an hour to go to get to my horse. And then my lesson is depending, you know, anywhere from one to two and a half hours. And I have to drive back and there's like all of this time. I'm like, I should be spending with him and I'm selfish. And, I, but that's not true. When you really sit with it, it's, I need to do this for a host of reasons, right? I go out right. there for, I, I said that the other day in my Twitter, I was like, this is where I learned the most about myself is actually wow. in nature with the horse. And yeah. that makes me a better wife. It makes me a better mom. And it just, it improves me in all areas. So it's really important to have like that positive, abundant mindset. I can't stress yeah. that further for anyone that's yeah. on that path to self-improvement. <laughs> um, so for anyone that has had enough pain and has reached like their their um, their max for pain and discomfort and shit, <laughs> what would you <laughs> suggest are like just the very first steps to take to to healing? Yeah. To- so again, 
I'm going to repeat those eight essentials. Mm -hmm. I have my clients if they want, I don't, I don't instruct anybody to do anything. Right. I always suggest like, if you want to, you take an inventory, you write them down in linear fashion. Dispenza will say the same thing. Like you write your intention on mm -hmm. the left, like what you want, just blah, 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 blah. And then you write the feelings on the right. Mm -hmm. And it has to be the feelings if you, if you had that. So we're mm -hmm. getting to that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you list your eight, one, a belief in something greater than yourself. You just start describing what that means to you. And it's individual. You don't have to share this with anybody. It's your thing. Two, what's your purpose? Small, medium, large. What's your b bigger? What's your medium? Some small purposes. Like sometimes, honestly, it's just to go outside, lay in the sun for 30 minutes and come back in. And like, that's it. Like, and that's not to be judged it's for some people. For them, not just to get out of bed was a big deal. You mm -hmm. know, so again, that's going to vary, but do a small, medium, large. Number three, your relationships. People that understand your belief in something greater and your purpose and support that. And then the people that also challenge those, we want them both. The ones that put the mirror in front, the ones that antagonize and, and ridicule and mock and just don't either boundary or totally gone. I'm a, I'm a totally gone person. Like it's just, you're out. Like there's mm -hmm. just nothing. Um, sleep naps. Again, what does that mean to you? How can we fit them in? Seven to 19 minute naps throughout the day. Maybe four or five of those. We have an opportunity to do a seven minute crash here or there. Um, sleep is huge. Breath, meditation, prayer. Again, whatever, whatever that means. You got to write it in, see what you currently are doing. Again, this is an inventory. Like not only what is it, but what do you do to like uh, be uh, mindful of each of these? Like, oh, what am I doing to tend to my purpose? Do I even know my purpose? Who is in my life? And you list your relationships that are, that are beneficial and the ones that beneficially challenge you. Mm -hmm. um, number six, getting outside. Where? How often? Uh, maybe your feelings. When you are outside, what do you, how do you feel? You want to start to connect those things. Number seven, nourishment. Um, starting to just, again, see what that is. Well, I eat out six days a week. I'm going to eat out four days a week and I'm going to make two meals. Bam, there's your change, you know? Uh, and then body movement. Uh, is the last one. Is it just daily walks? I like the, the, uh, there's a couple things on movement. We always link it to like exercise, uh, um, for weight loss or some sort of a sport. Um, but if we got inside our bodies at the cellular level, it would be a highway of speeding cars and all this stuff going on. Like, wait, nothing is still no digestion is movement healing is movement thoughts are movement light is movement like movement is life something very very simple a, a 90 plus year old heart surgeon who who uh is still operating i believe oh my god he goes uh he goes um move every joint the number of times you are years old per day so as you age you move those joints more which is so counterintuitive what we've been told if a joint is compromised, you move that joint two to 300 times. Wow. And I've been, I've been doing that for 20 years in my practice on different grades only. And if you think about your son, uh -huh. I think he takes like uh, 30,000 attempts to take three successful steps. So wow. 30,000 efforts like you and I, and I have rep schemes in my office that are sometimes 12,000 rep schemes. And I just did the other day, I posted, you know, a thousand RDLs and a thousand leg curls. There was like a wow. thousand. That I was like, well, I just did them in one shot, but somebody else could do them over the course of 16 hours. You know what I mean? So if you think about it, your, your son is going to like plank for hours. He's going to crawl thousands of steps like that is badass. And if we get back to what those kind of things give us in the in the they almost help integrate everything else. Now, here's what we do. You sit and you look at those that inventory and you be honest, be honest. Nobody's going to judge it. Nobody's going to see this. See where you can improve. Everybody knows. <laughs> uh, he's just not good for me. She's not good for me. That food is not good, but we don't want to like tell people. But you can say, yeah, yeah. And you just start to see these little checks. Okay, this is what I can improve upon. Then here's what I want. Here's the key. And this is back on Dr. Dawson Church. This is, this is the missing ingredient because everybody looks at that and goes, oh, there's a program. that I could check eight boxes. I'm going to be healthy if I check those eight boxes. No, you will not. And there's many, many people that will look at that and go, I, I did everything you said. What? You have to find how they're all integrated. 
the intention and the feelings behind all of them. We have to bring them all together. And that's the challenge. That's, well, that's the unique signature that we each carry because that list is the same for everyone, but it's not when we start filling it out, we start applying it. And then here's the deal, just like you said with the cup, you can't apply 100% of yourself to each of those every single day. It's not possible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'll do it. People will ask me, do you do an inventory? Yes, I have a running one in my head at all times. Everything I do will pop into one of those eight. Is this thing I'm about to take on going to help those eight? hurt those eight or strip one of those. Like that's what I, and if it does, if it takes apart, if it takes it away, I don't do that thing or I don't hang out with that person or I don't know when it comes to food, do I eat pizza? Do I crush a root beer? Hell yes. And I celebrate that because my intention behind that was different. Do I eat pizza all the time? No, if I did, I would make pizza all the time from scratch. Mm -hmm. So there's like, there's like a, a give and take and a being when you start to see like, how it all, there, there's no bad anything, you know, it's all, it's all stimulus. It's all teaching us. It's all just part of what we're putting together to put ourselves in the best position possible. And perfection is not it. We mm -hmm. can't be, it's okay. And I'm telling you right now, I'm telling you just by taking that inventory of those eight essentials. Now you're, you're tapping into a, a, a framework that the greats are using the dispensas, you know, the heel documentary, like all those practitioners in there are talking about those right there. They're healing, have people healing cancer, which yeah. we've been told is this crazy thing. There's people reversing these autoimmune. You did it. Like there's that right there is big time stuff. Big, very mm -hmm. potent, very, very powerful. So when we go in there and we start to do the work, then the only other factor that's uh, um, kind of a, uh, a difficult one and frustrating. And even for me, and I know for you, it's time. We don't like that things <laughs> take time. <laughs> <laughs> and so one of the things is to be fair with yourself because I got to do it with me. Minimum, like one to three months, give yourself the benefit of the doubt. I mean, it's taken 30 years, 12 years, a year, you, you know, about the, when, when a mother gives birth, you know, and it's like, why is my, my body image, whatever that is, not back? It took nine months for you to create a house to nourish and grow. And you want it back in. That is so unfair. It's wild. For the, you know, for mm -hmm. the system. Now think about it. Somebody comes in and they've been, you know, they've been led astray or they've had some things go on for 30 years. And mm -hmm. we're talking one to three months. Mm -hmm. I still think that's pretty good. But what if it took three years to heal? You're on this continuum. So who mm -hmm. cares? Just start. It's never mm -hmm. done. And I'm telling you right now, when you look at that eight, what that does is that empowers you because you literally have those, nobody controls those eight. It's you. That's it. Now you're the main player. And that's the key. You understanding that I am the one responsible. I am the one accountable. And we kind of went for a circle from where we started uh, with this conversation. Mm -hmm. And then you give yourself enough time and you will see some major radical shifts. And what happens is it's like fireworks. Uh, somebody asked me the other day, they go, why a thousand reps? <laughs> I'm, like, <laughs> I'm like, I know. Why did I choose that that day? It was the sun was shining. I was like, I wonder if I could. I wonder what it's going to feel like. It was like my firewalk. Do you know what I mean? Like I had this coal walk out yep. in front of me. No part of me wanted to do it. Just like I walked 29 miles last Saturday. Why? Oh my because gosh. I wanted I wanted to walk up the coast and explore the coast of California. And I wanted to get to that point on where I'm foot. like, on foot, I'm like, I can't do this. Do you know what I mean? But I'm going to, because I'm, I'm going to, I can do this. So I just set up these little challenges that are these little firewalks so that my body knows the capacity to what it has to offer. And every time we achieve one of those little things and to somebody, a 29 mile walk or a thousand reps, honestly, could be just setting the alarm 10 minutes earlier and actually getting out of bed, not mm -hmm. setting it and being like, no, but taking the activation energy to set both your feet down, be grateful you have two feet <laughs> and they work mm -hmm. <laughs> and get out of bed. That right there, you just, you just stimulated to a level greater than you did the day before. Now your, your baseline is so much higher that all those little mini stressors, the threshold's been raised. You don't even interpret them. You're not mm -hmm. even aware. And now we keep doing that. You and me and everybody else, we keep doing that, keep doing that, keep doing that. Now the shit that used to 
like break our whole thing and spill us over. We're like, all right, what else you got for me, life? Like I can do this. We got this. Oh, I might need a little help. I'm going to get some guidance, but it's on me. And now you start to see, wow, age really doesn't mean shit. Genetic whatever doesn't mean shit. Mm-hmm. No, your circumstances don't mean anything. It, it, you can shift it at any point in time. And we all have this power and this capacity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great place to end. Um, thank you so much for coming on. Do you want to tell the listeners where they can follow you, any upcoming projects and how they can support yeah. you? Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. So uh, we just re- we just launched this last Saturday. This is our baby. Uh, if anybody follows Alex Zek, Ali Zek, Dr. Joe Yi, myself, we just started a nonprofit. It's called Health Freedom for Humanity. Go to that website, healthfreedomforhumanity.org healthfreedomforhumanity.org. We just got started. I mean, we were like infants crawling, but we're like rapidly turning into marathon uh, uh, Olympic sprinters, excuse me. Um, And so what we're trying to fight for is the right to our bodily sovereignty um, Mm -hmm. and to be able to choose what we put into our bodies, who we involve in our health journey. Um, And there's, we're going to have major educational outlets because we need people to Get one, get information because accessing information is harder. And two, what's action steps you can put in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Spain? It doesn't matter where you are. We've got this community building and there's 20 of us that started this. We're so, so, so excited about it. Um, that's the nonprofit. Uh, it's on Instagram. Follow it. All the little follows are on there. Twitter, Facebook, everything. Um, my drsamijohn.com is my website. You can find all my, um, all my, my, uh, social media stuff there. I'm real, real big. The Instagram and telegram, um, are my two. And again, if anybody has any questions, DM me, I will get back to you. People are always like astounded. They're like, Oh my God, I didn't think you'd get back, (laughs) let alone a voice note. And I'm like, you're talking to a human. Yes. (laughs) it's okay. This is what we can use social media for in a positive way. You know, Mm -hmm. we're connecting with people around the globe in a split second. That is freaky. What's possible. So don't hesitate to reach out. Um, but I will not solve problems for you. I will (laughs) give you access to the information (laughs) that you can to take your life back because it's yours. You, you earned it. You, you won the lottery ticket of all lottery tickets. You were born powerful stuff. Again, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I appreciate it too. Thank you so much. That's it for this week's episode. If you enjoyed the podcast, please rate and review and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. You can also share this podcast with a friend. It helps my podcast grow and I really appreciate it. I hope to see you next week.